Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, find out why birds don't fall off their perches at night. Sharon Lovejoy enchants us and our children with dirty birdie facts and activities in my first bird book. On tour, see why patrons of the Boverde Spring Branch Library check out more than books. Daphne answers your top question and makes her pick of the week. And John has your backyard basic tips. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. At the Bulverde Spring Branch Library, kids and families check out lots more than books thanks to the Comal Master Gardeners. See how they turned a dead-end spot into a, one of perpetual wildlife motion. At the Bulverde Spring Branch Library, just north of San Antonio, people are checking out more than books and media. This is not just a library. This is a community center. We have programs for adults, for children, uh, being sort of out in the country here, it's a place for people to come and socialize. So when the new building opened in 2008, friends of the library and Kamal Master Gardeners dug in to extend the community outdoors in a butterfly garden. When we were in another building before we built this beautiful new library, I had an idea for a butterfly garden and I intended that it would be a learning tool for adults as well as children. They sited it at the edge of the parking lot, enclosing its sanctuary from a harsh view to busy highways below. They just say, okay, let's do that, and they do it. They don't wait, you know, till, oh, let's think about this and plan it. I mean, they do it. If it doesn't work, they don't do it again. If it does work, how do we improve on it? We invited the master gardeners uh, to come in and help us design, and there were about 12 of them who came over and we walked out on the property and one of them brought a spray can and said okay here's where we're going to do this bed and this bed and you want it sort of curved you don't want the hill to block the the butterflies you want to be able to see over the hill but you need to block the wind and so it started from that and then it evolved We put out a notice to library patrons that we would like plants donated and we got quite a few and then among us we all had some plants. We had a couple of nurseries that donated a few plants. Mostly they came from within our committee. Both Charlotte and uh, Lee are great propagators. We used the free mulch from the county and uh, then the friends of the library set aside some money uh, to be spent on things like the decomposed granite and that sort of thing. We have a lot of mulch down. We have brought in no soil. This is all native soil, but the mulch has helped to compost it. We've put newspaper under the mulch, which holds the moisture in some and keeps the weeds down. To select plants, they took a cue from the ones nature had planted on the windy hilltop. We've tried to keep this garden very natural without a lot of alien species, and I think we've been true to that. They went for deer resistance, evergreen structure, and plants that cycle flowers throughout the year for visual pleasure and to feed resident and migratory wildlife. In the wintertime, a lot of people don't know, but rosemary, either upright or trailing, will bloom with little blue flowers. The morning, if you have a sunny morning where it's 70 degrees, after you've had 25 overnight in this part of Texas, you'll have blue flowers on there. And amazingly, you go out at 10 in the morning and there's sulfur butterflies. That's a, that's a great nectar source during the winter for butterflies that become active when the temperature gets above 70. Well, one of my favorites is the blue mist flower which is a fabulous plant for attracting queen butterflies, which resemble monarchs, they're very closely related, but they are here all summer where the monarchs come through on migration in the spring and make a generation, and in the fall they're going back to Mexico where they overwinter. The queen is here all summer long. They bookmark each plant. If it's working here, I can do it at home, 
because the conditions, the climate, the soil is the same. And what the heck's the name of this plant, you know? And so getting those tags on has been, I think, key to the educational experience of seeing the plants, so to speak, in the flesh. To educate patrons about the garden's butterflies, Friends photographer Charlotte Trussell documents them and their life cycle for a library display. Back outside, patrons go on a discovery hunt to find the eggs and larvae they've come to recognize. It's sort of like the chicken and the egg. Which came first, the butterfly, the egg, or the larva? You have to account for all different stages. And we have plants here that do draw the butterflies for larva. Then we have other plants that provide nectar for them once they turn into butterflies. We also have plants that provide neither but our shelter during bad weather. Friends of the library, Lisa Reed, found a new passion, documenting wildlife with her camera. Lee and his son, Michael, are well attuned to the garden's visitors. To supplement butterfly food, especially in dormant seasons, Pat Robertson paints a plank with a concoction of beer, brown sugar, and overripe bananas. There's always fresh water. Although the plants don't need much tending, master gardeners like Bill Puckett and Peggy Ham tidy things up and water new plants until they're established. Thanks to a grant, a 40,000 gallon rainwater tank feeds the drip system for established plants. And what's a garden, especially a library garden, without a comfy place to read? With mosaic artistry, the master gardeners styled up an ordinary bench. Thanks to community partnerships, the Bolverde Spring Branch Library bridges knowledge from inside out. And uh, part of the knowledge we try to impart at, at this library, as well as the two others in Comal County, are to, to have it be an example of, uh, of what will work here. They come out and they look at plants and they say, well, if they can grow it here, I guess I can grow it at home. In the summer, they even teach classes to the little kids and they bring them out here and they walk them through and they teach them how to grow things. And so the, the friends that are doing this, are, they really have done so much to help the patrons, but the patrons love it. I mean, you see them out here all the time and, you know, they've been adding things like the picnic table and the benches, but you see families with their kids out here reading a book, you know, and, and the kids just love the butterflies and they'll find caterpillars and they'll be like, oh, we have to put it back. It's really amazing. It has just been wonderful. And a couple of times I've come out and there have been a, uh, children out here that the, the mother has been saying, we came to get books. And they have said, we have to do the butterfly garden first. We have had people here from out of state who come and take pictures and say they're going back and they're going to build a garden in their area. All right, thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. And now one of our favorite guests on Central Texas Gardener, Sharon Lovejoy, is back with My First Bird Book, uh, a way to help parents connect their children to the uh, love of nature through birds. Yes. It's always great to have you on the program. Thanks, We're going to start off with a bird word. What, these are things that you drop throughout the book, I take it? Well, I, I want children to understand that birds have a language. And so in Texas, you might hear this late at night. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? All. Who cooks for you? <laughs> the you all would be the Texas one. Y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who does cook for us? The, the barred owl with okay. the bright red eyes. If you go out with a flashlight at night and you shine it up in a tree where you hear somebody asking who cooks for you, mm -hmm. you'll get that bright red eye shine which mm -hmm. you see in a barred owl's eyes. And they are magnificent birds. They are. They and, are. And uh, actually, if you hear them speaking to each other from tree to tree, a little spooky at night. It's kind of wonderful. It is wonderful. And, and barn owls, too. When yeah. you're out here, you hear them going shh, like fingers on a chalkboard. Mm -hmm. Spooky. Spooky. Well, kids like spooky, they too. They love spooky, and I like <laughs> kids to go out at night to enjoy nature. I think it's important. Well, and that's why you, you've created this most recent book, beautifully illustrated with your Thank images. You. Thank you. And uh, it comes as, as such a cute little kit. It comes as a feeder as well. Well, I wanted that because one of the 
surest way to, ways to stop a child from loving nature is getting them out in the morning when it's 38 degrees and they have to wear boots and mittens and carry binoculars, which they will not be able to focus or find a bird. Mm -hmm. So when you have a window mount bird feeder and it has a little, uh, a little porthole in the back mm -hmm. as it attaches to the window children can go right up to it if they don't move a lot and watch local species that are easy to identify mm -hmm. and I picked out a few dozen easy to identify birds we're not trying to stump the child <laughs> we're trying to get them excited <laughs> yeah good idea <laughs> don't quiz them on the on the Latin names no. of these species <laughs> although they do remember that a robin is called Turtus migratorius. <laughs> That's their favorite bird name. <laughs> and what child wouldn't like that? <laughs> Even a grown-up child. <laughs> right, right. So uh, I think that's a, it's a wonderful concept, and uh, it's so important for uh, people to open the gateways of wonder and, and nature to their children. And, and birds are... Even as an adult, we have that fascination and love of birds. Truly. I think the important thing is that while you're opening that gateway, you're also yourself you're getting yourself involved in the birds and you become enthralled with it too mm -hmm. so you're helping them they're helping you the children mm -hmm. are helping you it's wonderful well, let's talk about a couple of the other the, some of the other species uh, uh, that you, you highlight in the book uh, mockingbirds of, are, oh i love mockingbirds me they're too. so brilliant and they have so such a repertoire <laughs> and they can come after you if you're around their right. nest i've had them pull my hair out but you know they're they're here they're active they're easy to watch they're they're fruit eaters, and mm -hmm. they'll eat worms and fruit, and um, they're just wonderful to watch. And I don't think there's a more joyful sound in the world than to sit and listen to a, um, a mockingbird at sunset on a beautiful day. I agree, <laughs> except at sunrise on a beautiful day, <laughs> right. greeting the day. Right. They are so much fun to watch. And, you mm -hmm. know, I love uh, red breast. It's hard because in Texas here you have over 620-some species of birds that pass through. So I've got about 34 mm -hmm. in here that you would see in Texas. And little downy woodpeckers. Oh, those are so cute. Oh, they're wonderful <laughs> to watch. Red-breasted nuthatch, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, called the topsy-turvy bird because they spend so much time upside down, mm -hmm. which makes it easier for them to find food hidden under bark that other birds don't find. Uh -huh. yes. And, you know, the, uh, uh, the woodpeckers are just fabulous to mm -hmm. watch. Uh, and hummingbirds, of course. Love the hummingbirds. Yeah. You're so blessed here. You have all those great salvias and penstemons that mm -hmm. the hummers love. And uh, I... That's one of the easiest birds to tame in the garden. Mm -hmm. We have them landing on the hummingbird feeder as we carry it to the hook, and they'll land in your hand if you have a little something like a little bottle cap or red one right. filled with filled with hummingbird syrup. So, yeah, those are the most fascinating. They are amazing. Just to and, and again, it, even as an adult, uh, the the sense of wonder and joy takes takes you right back to that childlike place. And it's so great to make the connection for the kids so that they will have those memories for the rest of their lives. It makes them kinder. They, mm -hmm. That makes them watch out for the world. It makes them more sensitive to the animals in the world. And that's something we have to do. We can't just let them be hooked up to computers because it cuts them off. Right, right. Well, there are all sorts of wonderful little anecdotal stories throughout the book. Um, uh, our, our producers picked out a few. Uh oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> one, <laughs> one has to do with dirty birds. <laughs> well, birds, <laughs> dirty birds. Um, if you see birds on the ground and they're flapping their wings and stretched out in dirt and tossing dirt all over, that's the same way we take a bath. That's a bird bath for them. Mm -hmm. And that gets rid of, you know, they'll preen themselves and they'll get the oil and the dirt off and they'll get rid of critters that might be living on them. So it's mm -hmm. just as important to have a little bit of dirt for them and, of course, water. Water's the magic elixir. All right. Tell me about hair to horns. Part of our body is keratin. We have alpha keratins and beta keratins. It's our hair and our fingernails. And a rhinoceros horn is made out of keratin and alligator claws and bird feathers. So it's <coughs> wonderful to say to kids, what do, what do we have in common with alligator claws and you know, just to, mm -hmm. to draw them in and give them, give them that link to all these magical things. And feathers are amazing. Yeah. One, one final little anecdotal thing that I think it's such a fun fact. Uh, kids ask, why don't the birds fall off the limbs at night? Yeah, that is fascinating. And um, the back of a bird's calf has a thin tendon so that when they land, and they land on a branch, the tendon 
causes their their claws to clutch the branch so that even if they fall asleep and the fun thing about birds is they may only have half their brain asleep and one eye open but they're able to ride out <laughs> storms on a branch so it's an amazing thing so mm. it, it's a tendon that snaps their claws into into place they are amazing critters now you've brought some things to share and I want to kind of and I don't want you tasting them uh, okay, I promise not to taste the suet, but <laughs> simple little things that, uh, that folks can do with their kids that will, again, get them very interested in, in, in the birds and also provide some sustenance to the birds. A sunflower is one of the easiest things to grow in a garden, and it's one of the best bird foods, and it'll attract a multitude of birds. They love black oil sunflower seeds. It's inexpensive and uh, it'll draw a multitude of birds. It's right at the top of my list of top 10 foods for birds. And the dried flowers have a beauty all their own. They do, they're they fabulous. They're great. And then um, another thing we can grow in our gardens that the I'll kids will up. love, gourds, which are one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what better thing? You can grow musical instruments, bird houses, bee houses, and this is a house for a wren. Mm -hmm. And right next to it, right Another next to it. Another wren house? <laughs> yes. I love this. This was by accident. Right, okay. This it... was by accident. This was, it became mm -hmm. a wren house. I had it hanging on a garden shed. Okay. And I uh, ended up tacking it at the bottom so mm -hmm. that the babies wouldn't fall out. But the mama wren went in and built a nest, as she will do in garden gloves and many mm -hmm. other things, but mm -hmm. that works and children love seeing something unusual. You just like hang this on a wall somewhere uh -huh. under, under an eve, overhang. Under an eve, right? right? And then you'll get to a, a wren nesting there. And I, I heard wrens this morning when I was out on my walk. Oh, there Austin. We have Carolina wrens all yep, over. Yep. Yeah, they're just wonderful. They're saucy and they are fearless. <laughs> okay, now I don't think we have time for the suet, but tell me about this guy. Believe it or not, carve your pumpkins, use your pumpkins for Halloween and Thanksgiving. And, and Christmas if you do pumpkin pie, but save the seeds for the birds, they love mm -hmm. them. Okay, easy to do and uh, e uh, very easy to dry out the seeds as well. That's right. And the birds will and appreciate And you can nibble them, them too. <laughs> Absolutely, if not bad toasted. I love them. <laughs> All right, well we'll save this suet for next time. All right. We'll, we'll just keep those pine cones ready for you. Okay. It's always a joy talking to you. It's my pleasure. Yes, uh, any next adventures for you? What's the next project? Oh, yeah. I just finished a middle grade novel for children. Oh, excellent. And um, let's hope. All right, <laughs> well uh, thank you again for being a part it of our program. Pleasure. Always nice to have you here. And uh, we look forward to the next project. Coming up next is our friend, Daphne Richards. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie. This week, I'd like to answer some questions about June bugs. As their name suggests, June bugs are most visible in June. And it seems like this year, we've been inundated with them. But if you weren't out after dark, you might not even have noticed them. While out on my nightly walk with Augie, there were so many June bugs flying around neighborhood lawns that it sounded like it was raining. It was funny to watch Augie's reaction when he got pelted in the face with them. With so many June bugs flying around this year, it was no surprise that my phone was ringing off the hook with questions about them. While the adults are simply a nuisance, the larvae of this beetle can be damaging in landscapes, especially in turf grass. And with so many adults flying around this year, it's likely that we now have lots of larvae developing in our yards. As you know, June bugs, especially male June bugs, are attracted to light. So the best way to keep them from annoying you is to turn off all outdoor lights at night. The females are more often found buzzing around in the landscape, since after they mate, they begin to look for a nice, soft place to lay their eggs. And to make sure that those eggs are protected, Females burrow up to five inches underground. As with most insects, knowing the life cycle is critical to controlling June bugs, whose larvae are referred to as white grubs. There are many different beetles that have white grub larvae, some of which are no threat to your plants. Non-threatening ones include those that you might find in your compost pile where they're actually beneficial. But if you have a problem with white grubs in your landscape, you should definitely treat for them, and timing is critical. Early stages of growth, when the larvae are small and actively feeding, are the only time that you can kill them. This occurs from about mid-June through early July, so now would be a perfect time to treat. And if you'd like to use beneficial nematodes to do so, which are great for controlling white grubs, it's important that you get the right species of nematode, since each species of nematode only attacks specific species of white grubs. June bugs are actually June beetles, 
So when reading labels on potential products to purchase, you'll see June Beetle on the label. Regret regrettably, I'll have to cut this discussion short since the fabulous CTG producer has not given me an entire program to devote to grubworms. But we'd be happy to send you more details. You can contact CTG through our website or send me an email and we'll send you links to some extension publications with all the information you'll need to control grubworms. You can find my contact information with a simple internet search for my name. Our plant this week is cassia, which makes a beautiful evergreen addition to most any landscape. Drought and heat tolerance are at the top of the list of plant characteristics for most people these days, and this plant has plenty of both. It'll thrive with only once a week watering and will survive on much less. The gorgeous yellow flowers that cover cassia in summer are a bonus since the vibrant green leaves are beautiful enough by themselves all year round. As with most naturally shrubby desert species, cassia can be trained into a small tree if you prefer or you can leave it bushy and full since it has a naturally round, pleasing shape with absolutely no pruning whatsoever. Cassia can take the worst of our intense summer heat and sunlight, so if you have a spot with reflected heat where nothing else seems to grow, cassia would be a good choice. It also takes the worst of our Central Texas cold snaps and has survived in our demonstration garden at the Extension Office through some uncommonly cold winters. For a shrub, it doesn't take much space, only getting about five feet tall and wide. We have another great viewer photo this week, snapped at my very own garden at the Extension Office. At our recent demonstration field day, Master Gardener Cheryl Williams showed off their fabulous upcycled compost screen. Her husband, Ed Kimball, used the handles from a broken down wheelbarrow to make the handles of the screen. Great idea! And this week in your garden, it's time to plant pumpkins. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit us at klru.org slash ctg with your questions and plants from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. Well, it's a good time to start thinking about that fall garden. You know, the small gardens you can manage with uh, transplants and seeds also. And uh, black-eyed peas could be going in right now. You could put in some more okra. Pumpkins would be planted. They'd be just on time for November if you did them now. Winter squash, there are many heirloom squashes that you can find in seed. Cantaloupes, honeydew, watermelons, a bunch of wonderful things, and many other things too. So um, the way to do that is you might take a seeding tray. It'll last you for many years. And as you can see, many different varieties can be planted at the same time. You can use a, a special mix for germinating the seeds, or you can mix something up like uh, earthworm castings, a very good way to start your own seeds. One of the nice things about starting your own seeds is you'll find the ones that you want that aren't available in the garden centers. So that's a nice thing that I like about them. They're wonderful seeds that you can plant yourself, and you know, you can find them um, in your garden as very productive or doing very poorly. Now you know what's going to work well in your garden. That's the beauty of planting your own seeds. The other thing is that when you plant, you might want to use a little bit of seaweed along the way. I would use a very dilute amount of seaweed, and uh, that helps the germination. It really does. It gets them off to a good, sturdy start. As a matter of fact, I might tend to, once the leaves are, the second set of leaves are there, I'd spray it with the, um, the, the seaweed also. It really makes the plants um, much hardier going through the summer, they need something like that. Now I use a mulch, whether it's around the seedlings or the transplants, I think a mulch is very important. It will drop the soil temperature a good 10 to 15 degrees. That's beautiful when you're trying to germinate in the heat or you're planting directly. So um, starting your own seeds, a very nice thing to do. Now the transplants are uh, good also. And the transplants can uh, contain uh, tomatoes as part of the selections. Tomatoes will be ready for fall, and uh, the cherry tomatoes will start producing very, very quickly. The other thing is peppers. Peppers are a great crop that uh, produce for fall. I like them in the fall quite a bit. And so there are many different types of peppers, whether you like hot ones or you like some of the milder varieties. They're all available out there. And also, many of the other types of eggplant could be going in. Eggplant is a wonderful one that produces in the heat of the summer. That's what it likes the very best. So I would be putting in some eggplant and then some squash. Yeah, you can start over. The heirloom squash will be a lot of fun. They're wonderful plants. They're very tasty. And they come in in the fall also. 
So I would look at some of the heirlooms to uh, transplant also. You can find the cantaloupes. A lot of folks have small gardens. And so in these smaller gardens, you might have a tendency to um, use just a few plants out there. When you're transplanting to the garden, whether it's the seeds ready to go in or the uh, vegetable transplants, one of the things to do is to go ahead and use a little bit of rock phosphate. This will really get them off to a wonderful start and you just put it in the area that the transplant is going into. Now herbs can also be started or you can bring them in as transplants. I really like them as transplants. Things like basil, bay laurel, epasote, a wonderful one to try out, and even lavender and lemon. So there are many things uh, that can go in. The lemon basil, that's the one that I think is really good. Mexican marigold mint, um, very good substitute for tarragon. And uh, sage could be going in right now. So uh, wait till September to plant cilantro. This is one that would bolt in the heat. And cilantro is a wonderful one to be um, growing out there at that time of the year. It's a good one for beneficial insects also. So this is a good time to start that fall garden. I'm John Dromgoul. I'll see you next time. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and join us on Facebook. Next week, Deborah Prinzig shares a bouquet of slow flowers. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.